Uh, all right, good afternoon. Um, again, my name is Chad Claus. I'm currently a resident in, uh, a neurosurgical resident um, in Michigan. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Dr. Bono, the uh, Spine Journal, and the NAS uh, Committee for allowing me to present our work. Um, so I will get started. And um, I have no f uh, we have no financial disclosures. Um, as we all know, you know, postoperative pain control following any type of lumbar fusion still remains challenging. Um, it often requires high doses of opioids, and we're, we're well aware of the issues with opioid use, a number of side effects, and they can all potentially cause prolonged hospitalization. The bigger problem is probably the unintended or potential for long-term addiction. And when looking at Gatorlac, it we know it's been widely used in a number of uh, other specialties. Our colleagues in obstetrics or orthopedics or even general surgery have all well have seen a, a well-established opioid sparing effect. The problem is that you know historically NSAIDs have been generally avoided in spinal fusion. On top of the uh, potential bleeding risk, there have been a number of studies that suggest uh, decrease in, in bone healing and even decrease in, in spinal fusion rates. Uh, however, more recent literature suggests that perhaps maybe this is just dose dependent or, or duration dependent or even type specific and that there appears to be a, a dose or duration uh, threshold uh, to which these effects maybe are either negligible um, or even reversible. And to highlight a recent systematic review, it's very clear that we really need a good quality randomized controlled trial to address this question. Um, so we sought to investigate the effect of short-term, low-dose use of Ketorolac, not only on spinal fusion rates, but complications, uh, pain control, patient-reported outcomes, and arguably just as important, its effect on opiate consumption. This was a prospective, double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled, non-inferiority trial with a two-arm parallel design uh, with a one-to-one -one block randomization. This occurred at two participating sites uh, for a total of six surgeons who all agreed uh, to perform a standardized, uh, minimally invasive T-lift uh, technique with the use of bone morphogenic protein, or, or BMP. Uh, all consecutive elective one to three level MIS T-lifts were screened for inclusion and exclusion criteria, and these primarily consisted of fusion confounders, and, and, and I'll highlight a few shortly. And this was an interim analysis um, from our study uh, starting in October of 2017 to July of 2020. Here's the inclusion, again, just elective T-lift, minimally invasive, one to three levels with the use of BMP. And the exclusion criteria is primarily uh, consisting of fusion confounders like uh, active tobacco uh, use, uh, revision surgery, or, or oral steroids, uh, et cetera. Our comparison groups consisted of one receiving a 48-hour scheduled uh, treatment of IV ketorolac, 15 milligrams uh, every six hours in addition to a standardized analgesic regimen. And the placebo or control group received a 48-hour scheduled treatment of IV normal saline again every six hours and in addition to that same standardized analgesic regimen. Um, not only did we uh, standardize the surgical procedure, but we also standardized the entire analgesic regimen, which started in the perioperative period, including the uh, standard uh, anesthesia induction protocol, and this carried even for, uh, along their entire stay in the PACU and in the postoperative uh, floor uh, highlighted here um, as the regimen. Our primary outcome was fusion rate um, evaluated by dynamic x-rays or CT if they had available. And this was via the SUIT criteria at six months, one year, um, and two years in those that were uh, found to have non-union at one year or those that were inadvertently affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, our secondary outcomes included opioid use, which was converted to IV milligram morphine equivalents. Any ketorolac related complications, pain scores, length of stay, and quality of life outcomes. Um, a non-inferiority margin was determined to be 0.15 or 15%, and with a 95% power, uh, we determined or estimated a sample size of around 300 fusion levels per arm to, in order to detect this inferiority. Our primary outcome was analyzed via univariate analysis and subsequently analyzed uh, in a per-protocol manner. 
Here's just a consort flow diagram just to highlight the flow of the uh, enrolled patients. We randomized 292 patients at the time of this analysis with 194 levels uh, analyzed for the primary outcome at one year. Uh, 246 patients were analyzed for these secondary outcomes. As you can see here, the patient demographics uh, essentially show no significant difference between the two groups um, and equally distributed amongst them. Uh, similarly, with the perioperative data, really no significant difference between the two groups with regard to the number of operative levels or, or estimated blood loss. When looking at fusion uh, outcomes, you can see at six months and one year, there was really no significant difference in radiographic uh, fusion between the two groups. And you can see here, this is just a, uh, a figure uh, showing the difference in proportion uh, for fusion at six months and one year, not reaching that inferiority margin that's highlighted here with the uh, red dotted line. Uh, when looking at secondary outcomes, um, we uh, observed a significant decrease in, in total opioid consumption um, in the Ketorolac group compared to the control. And similarly, we experienced or observed uh, a significant uh, mean opioid reduction in the first 48 hours at which they received that intervention. Um, this was all achieved uh, while maintaining equivalent postoperative uh, pain scores. And um, additionally, we saw a uh, significant decrease in length of stay in that group as well. Um, when looking at complications, the fear is oh, epidural hematoma, and we, we certainly did not observe any significant rate or uh, difference in rates of epidural hematoma between the two groups. Um, and, and then certainly with surgical revisions, particularly uh, pseudarthrosis, there was no significant difference between the two groups. Here's just a figure to uh, highlight that significant decrease in opioid consumption over the first 48 hours here delineated by uh, day zero, uh, day one, and day two. And again, this is just here to highlight uh, all achieved while maintaining equivalent, if not marginally better pain uh, scores uh, in the Ketorolac group that's highlighted here in blue. Uh, with regard to patient reported outcomes, both groups um, achieved uh, quality improvement in their disability, um, quality of life, and pain scores with really no significant difference um, at six months or one year. Uh, as with any study, there are certainly limitations, and the obvious one is this, the interim nature of this uh, limits its in in interpretation, uh, particularly with the primary outcome of fusion. When looking at the definition of what we said uh, chronic opioid use, um, it, tends, it will lend itself to some selection bias, and certainly it being a self-reported measure uh, would also lend it to be, uh, having some reporting bias as well. The overall lack of granularity of determining the number of opioids consumed or the type of opioids consumed preoperatively also certainly limits um, uh, the interpretation. As with many randomized controlled trials, the external validity or the overall generalizability um, of these results are, are, are limited really, in particular this study, to minimally invasive surgery and using the uh, transferaminal lumbar interbody fusion technique with the use of BMP. So really not extrapolated for other fusion techniques and certainly um, uh, without the use of BMP. Um, however, short-term use of low-dose Ketorolac and those that have undergone MIS TLIF um, saw significant reductions in postoperative opioid use and length of stay, uh, all while maintaining equivalent postoperative pain control. Um, we didn't, there was no association with increase in short-term perioperative adverse events, and these results demonstrate really a non-inferior fusion rate with the use of Ketorolac following MIST lift with the use of BMP. However, given the interim nature of this study, these uh, results uh, uh, and the confirmation of these results are certainly ongoing. I just want to thank and acknowledge um, some individuals who uh, played an important role in helping maintain and, and uh, implement this study as well. Thank you. Um, quick question for you on the indications. Did you see uh, the, what was the breakdown in indications in terms of, for example, pyramidal stenosis, reticulopathy, or recurrent disc herniation? Did you see any difference in terms of tortillus efficacy and reduction in pain? Um, and would you recommend treating patients differently based on their presenting indication? 
Uh, you know, in order to include as many patients, obviously, for the study, uh, we didn't particularly uh, focus on, on different uh, indications. So it was up to the treating physician who had, who had indicated that this patient would be a candidate um, for a one to three level TLIF would then go on to be uh, enrolled or potentially enrolled into the study. So whether or not the indication prior to that um, was not uh, established, it's certainly, uh, I, I'm sure certainly we could look back into it, but I don't have a particular answer. It's a good question though. Yeah, I think it's a good question because it was certainly would influence, uh, obviously not your fusion rates, but, but any type of clinical outcomes, the pain levels. They really have this podium in a weird spot. I'm ahead of you and you're behind me and very interesting. Uh, another question for you, Dr. Klaus. You, you, this is an interim analysis, and, and obviously we accept it as an interim analysis, but it, it's ongoing? Correct. And any, any, updated in, update, any updates in your results? Anything different that you're finding? Uh, <clears throat> we've tried to, obviously, like any randomized trial, we try to limit you know, the number of analyses. So um, <clears throat> this was the a priori analysis once we, once we reached the 50% benchmark. Um, the COVID-19 thing, pandemic really put a damper in not only, obviously, the number of surgeries that we were doing over probably a good eight, nine month period like everyone else, but also <clears throat> with recruitment as well. Um, we found that you know, patients were very reluctant to come back to clinic, the telemedicine took off, and so that had really been um, obviously impossible to uh, uh, predict, um, but certainly has changed uh, things a little bit, and I think it, in short has really uh, slowed our progress. So do you think you're done enrolling? You think you're just, you're gonna? Um, we're probably very close, yeah. Okay. All right, and then, uh... Anything else, you let me know. I will. One methodological question. You, in, in your uh, methods, you mentioned that you did block randomization. Were you, were you, did you establish blocks based on any other uh, potential covariables, or what did you mean by your block randomization? Um, so it was random, as a uh, random number generator to create blocks so that there was equal proportions over time. So over, I think it was a f uh, four blocks each, so that by the time there was four uh, randomizations, uh, statistically, there would be equal uh, amounts. Gotcha. Okay, but you weren't block randomizing for the presence of diabetes or nope. something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely okay. random, yes. Okay. Right. A quick question for Dr. Klaus. Um, could you remind me, so with regard to the secondary outcome measure, the pain, yeah. what were the Harry time points? Harry, introduce yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm Harry. I'm one of the residents here in Boston. Sorry. Um, what were the time points um, at which those were significant? Was that just the perioperative period, or was that at longer time points as well? Uh, for the pain? Yeah. Um, so the, the pain scores were, were uh, collected um, only during the 48-hour period where they were receiving the intervention. And that time point started at the time that they got that first uh, uh, intervention, which was in the PACU. So that was uh, about you know, eight or nine uh, every six hours they received that, uh, that, those pain scores during that time. And so there was no significant difference. Really what we showed was that while giving Ketorolac, not only do we not have any complications, but we significantly reduced their opiate consumption. And the biggest question for many people is, well, yeah, you, you decrease their opiate consumption, but they're in just as much, if not more pain. What we, what we showed that they're, they're having equivalent pain, if not marginally better, maybe not statistically, but uh, they are having equivalent, maybe even a little bit better pain scores while also reducing their opioid consumption. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? I'll ask Dr. Klaus one more. Ooh, hold on. Nope. Spam email. I thought it was from Dr. Raja Sakharan. Just, just a spam. Um, the... Uh, the surgeons were blinded to the, uh, to the patient group, correct? Yeah, every, everyone was blinded to okay. the inter, uh, allocation, yeah. What, was there any, what, have you unblinded at all, and, and specifically just trying to figure out if the surgeon was at all influenced in the decision to determine a pseudoarthrosis um, in, in, the, in the practice? Uh, 
Because yeah, I know it was independent neuroradiologists who, who, that you use that data, but if they needed anything clinically, uh, in, in other words, going to the CT, because that was one of the, the big reviewers' uh, complaint or, you know, a critique of the study is that CT should have been done on everybody so that you equally determined if, uh, if there were pseudos in both groups. Yeah, so, you know, I get the, the short answer is they were blinded. Um, they didn't, they were no, uh, uh, they were not aware of any uh, allocation for the entirety, even if the patient had a complication. Um, the, the patient was not blinded unless the care of that patient required the knowledge of, uh, of that allocation, which n did not occur. Um, so that, and then on the side of, you know, CT, I know that's a, that's a fair um, critique, but Really, it was, it's more of a, it was more of a clinical uh, scenario situation which prompted uh, CT. And so I think their allocation, I don't know if their allocation would have made any difference, but I can see where that might uh, prompt questions. But the, the decision to get the CT was based on the surgeon's determination, and the surgeon did not know which group to pick. Right, it was based on a clinical uh, scenario, clinical situation where yeah. the patient either had signs or symptoms of you know, a, a pseudarthrosis um, and then subsequently received a CT that showed non-union and then that would prompt the revision if that was the, the scenario. I, I think that that's thoughtful. Yeah.